All right, build this house. If you're new, join in with us right now. Uh, we're not building your house. We're not building like your physical house. We're, when we say build this house, we're talking about the house of God. And, and way back when we started this in, in the, kind of the beginning of September, we, we kind of looked at this idea that although at one point it was very true that the house of God was tangible and physical, that's not necessarily true today, not in the same way. Like, like in the Old Testament, the house of God, it was first called the tent of meeting, then the tabernacle, then it was called the temple. Um, it was, eventually became like brick and mortar. There was real stone in it. But today, the New Testament uh, picture says that we, the church, are like living stones. Like, like this is the picture. You are a constructive material. You're a stone, a living stone that is designed to be in a construct with other people. And when we come together in a very unique way, we become the house of God. But, but then we, so that was kind of how we set it up. And then we started asking questions, well, if this is true, then what type of house does God want to build? Like, I think this is a very important question. Does God have preferences? And I think the answer is yes. Like all throughout the scripture, it, it, it actually, God speaks to us about what he wants and, and what he desires of us. And so that's kind of set us kind of on this journey this fall. And so we've just been looking at unique things that we believe the Lord wants us to build here now. We looked at being a house of hope, a house of love, a house of faith, a house of generosity last week and this week. I want to talk to us about building a house of integrity. Building a house of integrity. If you have a Bible, why don't you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, there should be some in the seats in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, that is our gift to you. Hebrews 12. What I want to do, I, I want to read a, a short passage of Scripture that we're going to spend our time in today. In this scripture, in a very real way, the Lord has placed on my heart, I'd say for probably the last, I don't know, like five or six months, something like that. Um, it, it is just, it's ministered to me personally. It's just something that, that God has, has brought before me time and time again. And I do believe that it's going to help us, all of us today, learn how to be people of integrity. So let's read Hebrews 12, just verses 1 to 3. It says, Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. Let's just pray really quick. Lord God, right now, over this next time that we have together, we're just asking, God, that you would speak. Lord, as we, as we dive into these ancient words written 2,000 years ago, Lord, I pray that they would speak life in the house this morning. Over every individual, over every circumstance, Holy Spirit, right now we surrender to you. We want to hear from you. So speak, Lord, we pray. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Hebrews 12, that text that we just read, it's important that you understand that it is set on the backdrop of a race, right? For the author of Hebrews here, uh, living a life of integrity is a lot like running a race. And, and, and there's kind of a reason why we're getting this analogy. And because in the first century Greco-Roman world, running was a big deal. Racing was a big deal. It was arguably the biggest deal. I mean, I mean, they would pack stadiums. People would come from all over to watch people compete in many different things, but specifically the foot race. And so the author here is kind of picking up on this and just saying, so just like they run, 
just like they strain, just like they press on towards the prize, church, so do we. Living a life of integrity is a lot like running a race. So today we're going to explore the question of just how do we run? Like what does it look like for a man or woman in the 21st century to live out integrity? How do we run the race of our lives here? So out of this text, what I want to do is I want to pull out three different thoughts. Um, Now, if you're taking notes and you should take notes, thank you, Jan. You know, Jan always takes notes. It's amazing. Pastor Gary, on the other hand, I'm calling you out, friend. Uh, you read her notes. You read. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I was away at the youth retreat they, uh, last weekend, which, by the way, like God moved in our youth last weekend. It was amazing. And, uh, but they just had this line. They said, note takers are, are history makers. So if you're not taking notes, feel really bad about yourself right now. All right, three points. You can write them down or not. Be like Jan or like Gary. It's up to you. All right, point number one. How do you run the race of integrity? First, by removing excess weight. This is important. When I was younger, like grade school, high school, I was really into racing. Uh, It was probably my number one sport. I played a lot of different sports, but like, Racing was my thing, uh, specifically the 100-meter dash and the 200-meter. I was a pretty quick kid, and it just kind of came naturally to me. I, I, I loved it. It was good. And, and, and there's, there's just something. When you're racing with the intention to win, I'm not talking about a leisurely jog. I'm talking about when you are racing with the intention to win. What you do is you're actively looking to discard all the different weights in your life. Like, like this takes place with the the, the shirt you wear, the shorts you wear, the shoes you wear. This is what we do because every extra ounce slows you down, right? This is exactly what Hebrews teaches here. Go back with me into verse one. It says, therefore... Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, push the pause button right there, okay? The cloud of witnesses that it's talking about is Hebrews chapter 11, okay? Right before this, Hebrews 11 is a long chapter chronicling story after story of men and women who ran their race well to the end. Not perfect, but they made it to the end. And now they're saying, all right, so since we have all these stories of men and women who ran their race well, it says this, let us, church, let us run our race well. Well, how do we do that? Keep reading. By throwing off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. The first thing we need to take very seriously in running this race is that we are removing anything and everything that holds us down. Anything that that is an extra weight on us, we need to remove. Now, in this text, it specifically calls out two different things. It says that we need to remove, I'm just calling it stuff that hinders. And it says that we need to remove sin that entangles. There's two different categories, sin and stuff. Now, historically, I think in the church, we've read this passage and we see one part of that, right? We we, we, kind of read this text and we're like, all right, pastor, I know where you're going with this. I'm already ahead of you. I need to stop sinning. It's like, well, yes, you do. (laughs) And so do I, okay? That is part of this, but that's not the whole story. Here it says, it says, yes, we need to remove sin and everything else that hinders. I want you to listen to me very carefully. There are things in all of our lives, probably right now, that aren't sin. And Jesus is still asking us to get rid of it. Like, I'm not talking pornography. 
I'm not talking greed. I'm not talking like, like you're out murdering people, you should stop murdering people, that's sin. Like, like I'm, not, I'm not talking about just the big bad stuff we know is wrong. I'm talking about stuff. Stuff in our life that doesn't even fall under the category of sin. Jesus is still asking us to give it up. Why? Because it doesn't help you run. It doesn't help you run. <laughs> the point here is that we are doing everything in our ability to run as fast as we can. It's to run this race as well as we can. So we need to get rid of sin for sure and everything else that is hindering us. Listen, I, I've, I've said this multiple times before. I'll say it multiple times again. God is more concerned in doing a work in you than he is through you. Okay? To God, your character matters more than your career. To God, your character matters more than your charisma. Hear it this way. Who you are matters more than what you do. So God says, you got to give it up. And listen, I don't know what that is right now. Like, there's a lot of us in this room. My guess is the Spirit of God is speaking in many different ways right now, exposing sin in our lives and just stuff that we're holding on to that isn't helping. And it says, you gotta, you got to throw it off. This is what's really interesting. You know how they catch monkeys in, in South America? Um, it's really, really not that sophisticated. Um, what they do is they get these coconuts and they drill these little holes in the coconuts just big enough for the monkey to fit its hand in. But before the monkey gets there, they, they put a bag of sweet rice inside the coconut. So the monkey smells the sweet rice, it sniffs it out, finds the coconut, puts its hand in, grabs onto the sweet rice, but now that it's holding onto the sweet rice, it can no longer get its hand out of the coconut. And trappers literally have the easiest job. All they do is walk around picking up monkeys whose hands are stuck in coconuts. And, and, and the, the, the sad thing is they could be free at any moment. All they have to do is let go of the sweet rice. Parkwood, I'm just going to say it this way. Don't be a monkey. Okay? And if that offended you, then just let the word fall. Okay? Don't be a monkey. Okay? Like, you, whatever it is that in this moment right now the Spirit is placing on your heart, whatever that sin is, whatever that stuff is, you have to let it go. If you are serious about running this race with integrity, you have to throw it off. The very first thing we need to do when we're learning how to run a race is we need to dress appropriately. Okay? That means removing all the sin and all the stuff. That's point number one. Are you with me this morning? Okay. Point number two, how do we run the race? Not just by removing the excess weight. Number two is this, that you need to look in the right direction. It's very important when running a race that you're not looking to the side or looking behind you, right? It just, it just throws you off. When, when, when you're running with an, with an intention to win, you set your gaze where you want to end up, right? You set your gaze where, 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 where like the destination is. And again, let's go back to our text. So right after it says dress appropriately, right? Throw off all the hindrances and sin. It then says this. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. So here's the question. So, so why does the author tell us to always look to Jesus? Why is it important that we're always looking in the right direction? Why in this race of integrity are we called to set our gaze upon Jesus? Now this is very important because here it is, ready? Where you gaze, you go. Where you gaze, you go. My, my wife, Natalie and I, she was in the nine o'clock service this morning. We've been married for 14 and a half years. And I can tell you, there's one argument 
that has surfaced for 14 and a half years. It doesn't go away. You wanna know what it is? It's, I'm a distracted driver, okay? So here's what happens. There's just these moments, okay? And this started long ago. And we're just driving down the street. And then eventually what happens, something gets my attention out. This, anybody with me? You ever have this moment? Yeah? Okay, it's not just me. Okay, thank you. So we're driving down the road, and all of a sudden I look out, and it's like a squirrel eating ice cream on a sidewalk or something, right? <laughs> like, and it's something that, like, in that moment, it's like, oh, that's neat. And most people just keep driving. For me, I'm like, oh, that's neat. And I continue to look as I'm driving down the road at the squirrel eating the ice cream. And then inevitably what happens as I'm driving that car looking at the squirrel, I start to drift (laughs) over towards the squirrel. And it's at this point in the car that the argument ensues. I cannot tell you how many times my wife has saved our lives by yelling at me and telling me just to look straight, <laughs> you know? Like, but this is what happens over and over and over. It's, it's this slow drift. It's not a hard pull. It's a slow drift. I think for some today, this is actually a really good analogy of maybe where you find yourself right now. It's like you can remember a time in your life when you were more passionate about Jesus and the things of Jesus and the work of Jesus and and it was there, like you were on fire. And now you find yourself in a place where you're just not. And and you're kind of questioning, like like how, how... How did I even end up here? How did I get to this place? And listen, I got to tell you, there's just a really good chance that what happened was at some point you started looking out the side window and you didn't look back. And it's amazing, once you start looking out that side window, window, again, it's not like you see the squirrel and it's like, like that, that doesn't happen. You look out the window, it's not a strong pull, it's just this slow drift away from your purpose. It's a slow drift away from your calling. It's a slow drift away from God's plans for you. And eventually, even the slightest little drift, you give that enough time and you will find yourself miles away from where you should be. This is what it's saying here. This is why the author of Hebrews is saying, if you want to take this race seriously, yes, throw off the sin, throw off the stuff. You got to remove it all, but not just that. He says, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus. You need to look at Jesus. You need to gaze upon Jesus. Why? Because where you gaze, you go. And as your pastor, listen, with with as much love as I can bring in this moment, I implore you, look to Jesus. Get your eyes back on Jesus. If you're in that spot right now where once you were really hot, like on fire for Jesus, and now you're cold and indifferent, the only way back is by looking to Jesus. The only way back is by getting that laser focus back on the destination itself, and that is Christ. This is integrity. Integrity does not mean that you're going to run the race with perfection. Go read Hebrews 11. There's not a story in there like that. But what we do have is story after story after story after story of men and women who were just doing this. They get off and then they come back. They get off and they recenter, right? What integrity means is not that you're going to make mistakes, but it's when you do that you're going to be serious enough to, to correct the mistake. Like I just believe what God is wanting out of us today, it's, it's like he's 
It's like he's just bringing us back in alignment to himself. So yes, throw off sin and stuff. That's where it starts. But as we run, as we run this race, you better be running after Jesus because if you're not, you're running after something else. You can't run after the world and after Jesus at the same time. You can't run after money and after Jesus at the same time. You can't run after stuff in Jesus at the same time. It doesn't work. And if you're confused in how you got where you are, listen, just chances are it's because at some point you started looking at the squirrel. And the squirrel's entertaining, right? There's a reason why we look at the squirrel eating ice cream on the sidewalk. But you look at it long enough, man, it will kill you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's point number two. Now we get into point number three. How do we run the race of integrity? We remove the sin. We remove the stuff. We get that laser focus. We're looking in the right direction at Jesus. And now the final point is this. We need to learn to run with grit. With grit. Hebrews 12, our text in verse 2 says, run with perseverance. Some translations will say you need to run with endurance. My word, grit. I just like the word grit. Grit is the knowledge of something being difficult and still pressing through. Okay, grit is this like inner mental resolve that no matter what comes your way that you're going to push on. This is grit. And it's what God is calling us to live through. Like I said, um, I was a sprinter, right? 100 meter, 200 meter, those were my races. And growing up, I did pretty well in these races. And I got into high school. Um, I went to Kennedy Collegiate Institute. Anybody from Kennedy here? Whew. Four of us. That's great. Okay. I ran track for Kennedy, and uh, it was our very first track meet. And uh, I'll never forget, we got there. I was not told this ahead of time. I was ready to run the 100-meter dash and the 200-meter. And then our coach said, hey, everybody today is running the 400-meter. Because even if you come in dead last, you're going to get points for the school. So everyone, go to that table and sign up for the 400-meter dash. So I thought he was kidding. <laughs> so everyone else is signing up. Some time went by. And he came back and said, Danny, you need to sign up. The problem was, by the time that I signed up, the only spot left for me to run, I still don't know how this even worked out, it was me, a grade nine, 14-ish years old, running against the seniors in a heat filled with 18 and 19-year-olds double my size that specifically had trained for this run. And so I thought to myself, it ain't no, ain't no big deal. Danny, you got this. So I, you know, lined up. And because I had no clue how to run this race, and I was in over my head with all these people older than me, all I thought was, Danny, just give it your all. Just keep up with the pack. You're going to do great. So as runners, take your mark, set, go. And I gave it everything. And I am running at 100%. If you don't know, the 400 meter dash is just like once around the track. It's, a, it's actually a very difficult race to do well. But here I find myself, 14 years old, keeping up with the seniors. This is the stuff legends are made out of, okay? In my mind, this race is going down in history. They are going to talk about the day that Danny Gray beat the seniors. And we're at about 200 meters in. We get about 250 meters in, and I'm right in there in the middle of the pack. And then all of a sudden, right here, I get a sharp pain like nothing I've ever experienced before. And I gotta tell you, I've never felt this pain before because I don't do long distance running. I run the 100 and the 200, it's so short, you have no time to cramp up. 
But now I'm in a longer run and I find myself in a situation and I'm in pain at the same time that the pain comes in. It's like my gas tank just depleted. And so what do I do? Do I push on to be a legend? No. (laughs) I walk (laughs) the rest of the race. (laughs) I kid you not, it's amazing how fast I went from being a legend in my own mind to probably running the slowest 400 meter run in the entire nation that year. Like, it was the worst. And it was humiliating because the last 100 meters, that's where the stands are. Right? That's where like everybody's watching. Nobody saw the good part of the run. All they're watching is Danny Gray just holding my side. It's like, you know, like, (laughs) I had no grit. I had no perseverance. I definitely didn't have endurance. In the moment that I found myself in a situation where the race didn't go my way, I threw in the towel and started walking. The moment that things got difficult, I said, I'm done. (laughs) I'm going to walk the rest of the way. Parkwood, we need a grit about us. We need a perseverance for the race ahead because, listen, it's difficult Like there's nothing in the scripture that says like if you start following Jesus, everything is gonna be easy. You just put it in autopilot, just coast for the, no. In fact, the scriptures go out of their way repeatedly to prepare us for moments when the race doesn't go the way we think it should. Look at this, verse two into three. It says, for the joy set before him He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then it says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The Bible says in church, you need need to have a grittiness about you because it's not easy. There's gonna be moments here, it says, that you're gonna grow weary. There's gonna be moments where you're gonna wanna throw in the towel and just quit. And so it says, here's what you need to do. You need to consider the sufferings of Jesus. So let's do that for a moment. Let's just take a moment. Let's, let's consider the opposition that Jesus faced. I mean. I mean, this is Jesus, right? King of kings, Lord of lords, the healer, the redeemer, the life sustainer. This is Jesus. Who would think that anybody would oppose him? Oh, but they did. Like no one would have ever expected that from the moment that God incarnated himself into flesh, the person of Jesus came into this world right from the very beginning, people were trying to hunt him down. King Herod, go read the Christmas story. And then it goes on from there, right? Jesus enters into his public ministry. And what happens? All of the religious leaders of the day, all of them start tag-teaming against Jesus. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, uh, the Herodians, the chief priests, the elders, they all got together conspiring, how do we take him down? No one would have ever expected that. Nobody would have ever expected that Jesus would stand trial for crimes that he did not commit. No one expected that this Jesus, creator in the flesh, as he hung on the cross, would be spit on and mocked by his creation. And as he died, no one expected the sun would go dark. The ground would shake. And the world would lose hope as they buried a dead king in a borrowed grave. Nobody expected this, Jesus. 
Park would consider the opposition of Jesus. Because it's exactly what we need to hold us in when the going gets tough. And you might be like, okay, well, how? How does knowing that Jesus' race was difficult help me run my race today? Can I tell you how? Because it is precisely in his sufferings that it shows us how much he loves us. It is when we look at the cross that we see just how far God was willing to go for us. I love that line, right? It says in verse two, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It's important that we understand what the joy was or rather who the joy was. You are the joy that was set before him. I am the joy that was set before him. It's as if when Jesus hung on the cross, he could see through like the eons of time and he could see every person that would come under his blood that was being shed in that moment. Who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So when life gets tough and it will, when, when all of a sudden you cramp up and it's not going the way that you think it should, consider Jesus. Consider the sufferings and the opposition that he faced because it's there that he truly showed us just how much we mean to him. It's there that he paid it all for us. And if, and if it's there in his sufferings that he gave it all for me, then I'm gonna at least attempt to give my all for him. Can we stand up to our feet? Park with this is the race of your life. This is integrity. We need to remove all the weights, all the hindrances, all the sin. Not just that, then we need to set our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. And lastly, we need a grittiness about us. Listen, I cannot promise anybody here today what's gonna happen tomorrow. I can't promise you what's gonna happen by the time you get home. I don't know what joys are in front of you and I don't know what sorrows are either. But what I do know is that we serve a loving, good God who suffered <laughs> for us. When the scripture says, get the, when the scripture says when he was on the cross, he could have called 10,000 angels, it means it. He could have and he didn't. Mere men did not somehow figure out a way to kill God. God came into the world for that moment to suffer and to die. He came knowing the race would be difficult to set a model for us, but to also show us just how far he's willing to go for us. So church, run well. Run well. This is the race of your life. No two peoples on earth, I said this in the nine, no two peoples on earth have the same race. You and your spouse do not share the same race. Maybe some similarities, but it's not the same race. Your, like my race is different than my wife's. And one day when I die or Christ returns, either way, I'm gonna stand before Jesus and I have to give an account for how Danny Gray ran the race. My wife won't be there with me. My kids won't be there with me. My church won't be in the background cheering me on. As much as I'd like you there, it's my race. And it's your race. So run with integrity.